Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, the invitation to come here and, and speak before you. And thank you so much for everything that you've been doing to help and to uh, get the message out about my house file 229 and 226. Uh, it's been a battle since since I started in the legislature. I'm in my third term, fifth year, but uh, it's uh, it's a fight that's worth fighting. This is for our kids, this is to protect our children. And House File 229 comes from me reaching a point of saying, I'm no longer going to continue doing this the way the government wants to work. What I learned in the uh, three terms that I've been there is that they only want to do incremental steps to everything. They never want to get anything done, it would seem. They want to make sure that they do something so that they can say, use it on the election trail. So they can say, look what we're doing. Look what we get. We've got more work to do. By golly, I need your votes. And coming from uh, the law enforcement field where I worked on, where I worked on uh, gangs, guns, and violent crimes task forces and narcotics, we had a mission. We had the objective, we had the plan, we executed, we got the work done. We got them rounded up, and we got them to the right place, behind bars where they should be. And that's what I'm trying to do with these uh, house files, with these child pornography legislation. Now, Now I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, a little bit of the history of uh, working on this piece of legislation. I started out uh, being being approached by uh, investigators in the child pornography, uh, the victimization of children through uh, computer crimes, uh, who worked back in my home district, the District Two A. And I suppose uh, that's, I should have told you that to begin with, where, where I'm representative for. But uh, that is uh, North Central Minnesota, Lake of the Woods County, Beltrami County, Clearwater County, and Hubbard County. So I've got uh, investigators working hard up there, trying to protect their children as well. And they came to me and, and told me that they are not getting any justice for these kids, for these victims. They're having to try to get their cases heard in front of a federal judge, prosecuted by a federal prosecutor, because that is the only place that they get any justice. That is the only place that, and I'm gonna, uh, just gonna say these sick individuals who are preying on our children will ever be, will ever be stopped. As it stands, our, our uh, child pornography uh, statute from production to possession is a presumptive, presumptive stay. That means that they do little to no time behind bars, then they do probation, and then they're back out on the streets again. The one horrifying story of that is an individual in Beltrami County, a, a really good friend of mine who retired from uh, law enforcement was the, the uh, child pornography investigator. And he told me, he had this individual on three counts, three separate counts, that should have put him away. But the county attorney decided to throw two out and give him a deal on one. This individual did very little time, got out, came back, murdered his girlfriend at the time, burned the house, and took the child that she was in, taking care of. Molested her and left her for dead in a shack in Northern Itasca County. That's just one of the stories. I get these horrifying stories from these investigators who are on the front lines fighting for these kids. So after several turns of trying to negotiate, trying to play nice, trying to build relationships across the aisle, 
And in the other body, every time, they would run it down to having no teeth. Or they just wouldn't get me a hair. And I and finally, out of, out, of, out of frustration for them not taking this seriously, or not wanting to talk about it, or being afraid to, to take a bold step, I got a hold of, uh, of a gentleman in uh, Protect, the Protect organization. And he gave me some ideas. And then I went to our, our nonpartisan house research and I said, I want legislation that mirrors the federal guidelines. I want them to carry the big stick, but I want a stick that's going to be substantial. So he came back with that, and I gave everybody fair warning. I'm done playing. I'm done trying to work with people that won't do any, that won't work. And so I dropped that into the hopper, and it's been a, it's been uphill since. But that's okay. That's okay because if it takes, you know, like, I, like I told one of my friends, if it takes walking in the office and bringing an axe and dropping it on their desk, this is what I'm going to use to try to get them to come alongside and help me work on this. And when most of the time all they bring out is, well, let's use this butter knife instead. That is the analogy, that's what I'm tired of, of, of them coming back with something that is, that is just nothing. I had to do that with, uh, to get them to move on, uh, it was House File 226, the states of adjudication. We had a lot of predatory offenders who were getting these stays. One, either it was a child that could not testify or a woman that could not, could not testify of fear. So these individuals would have to stand in court and admit to what they had done. And then they got the state of adjudication, which after five years or so disappears off their record. And so they resurface again with more victims. Same or similar crimes. But it's like we're starting over. So House File 226, I went into that to hold them accountable, to make sure that they registered as a predatory offender, and if they offended while they're on that probation term, they would come in as criminal history points so that they would go away. Nobody wants to touch that either. Separation of powers, they keep saying. I said, wait a second, we write the legislation, don't we? We can adapt legislation so that the courts can execute. But they keep making excuses. Yeah. That one was for separation of powers. House file 229, the child pornography, is because it costs too much. Because it costs too much. So I asked them, well, what's, what's the safety of our children worth? Compared to light rail? I was asking for $6 million on the, during the House uh, Omnibus bill for public safety to help our uh, crime, our crime, uh, our violent crime task forces to go in and to be able to help cities like Minneapolis, who are just <laughs> the homicide. The homicide rates are are just skyrocketing, and so have many other violent crime rates in that city because they are undermining, understaffing their police force. Make it so that they cannot do their job. But House File 249, that would cost 1.3 million in fiscal year 22 and 23. In fiscal year 24 and 25, in the tails, it'd be approximately 4.8. So right around a ballpark of six million dollars. Just what I asked for that they're going to give to uh, these activist groups. To go patrol the streets. Okay? Instead of giving it to our, our law enforcement community to try to be more proactive, go after these uh, predators more aggressively, to get our statute brought to where it should be to protect our children.
and to have justice for these victims. When I presented when I presented this bill and asked the, the DFL chair in the House for help, I asked several people on the DFL side, "Will you help me with this?" I got no response last last year, last session. So I made sure I kept it going. I requested hearings for it right from the start of this session. Crickets, nothing but crickets. I asked several more of them if they would help me with this. Still nobody came forward. I've had a couple of DFL since, it, since after after third <laughs> after third deadline means they're not going to hear the bill this year. Got a couple more DFL to sign on, but hey, at least it's a start. So I went along with the with the uh, minimal baby steps that the Senate put in to their omnibus bill. And these are uh, from the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. The Sentencing Guidelines Commission came back with, here's the minimum, here's what we think needs to be done. And I'll just go through this here. The massive collections threat to all kids, over half, uh, over half the contact offenders, over half of them are contact offenders. Three possible charges at the state level, 229, my bill, would have made four to allow possession to be charged in the receipt and receipt. And that was an addition that I put out to House file 229 was also receipt. And that had mandatory minimums connected to that. And that does carry prison. The three charges are production, distribution, and possession. The Senate came in after after the uh, Sentencing Guidelines Commission came back with their findings. The Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission report was released in early 2021. This is early 2021. It changed the result of the sentence to prison for producing child pornography, but only if the victim is 12 years of age or under. So only if the victim is 12 years of age or under for production. Or if the predator is a repeat offender, note that the cases where a victim is 12 still egregious. The MSDUC report tells of uh, underage prostitutes who are over 12 years old being drugged during sex. This horrible, horrible videos and imagery. I guess, I guess what they do to those, those youth don't constitute uh, prison for production. You know, a small, a small majority, all appointed by the state's Democratic governor, uh, declined to change the presumption from probation to uh, prison when a predator is caught possessing and trading in child rape and torture imaging. To excuse the status quo, the Minnesota, Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission majority complained about, like I told you before, the cost. Complained about the cost. Of the added prison beds, about $36,000 per year per person, which ignores, which ignores the current cost uh, rehabilitation programs and law enforcement uh, resources used to attempt to monitor the hundreds of predators released on probation. I'll tell you a little bit about that cost, $36,000 per bed in the prison system. One person, one, violent, one uh, predator going through the program at St. Peter is approximately $120,000 a year for that person. And I think, I'm, I think I'm being conservative on that number. And I'm to understand that once they are there, they do not come out. But that is where that money is going. But this is too much. This is too much cost here. And I did 
when I was a deputy sheriff, I did the predatory offender tracking in my home county. And it didn't take you very long to figure out who you were going to be right now to send in for a violation to try to send them back to where they belong. But even then, it took multiple, multiple times to try to get them sent back to, uh, to incarceration. The Minnesota Safety Guidelines Commission also cited a study that supposedly claimed low recidivism for internet offenders, but they ignored the study's own authors who cautioned that they were only measuring offenders who were caught a second time. When you, when you bring these guys up and there's no penalty, they're going to learn from their mistakes. So they define changing to presume prison for disseminating and possessing. So the state Republicans in the Senate, God bless them, they're changing the law so prison is finally presumed in, in dissemination. And this is bringing, bringing Minnesota, if they get this passed, it's bringing Minnesota in line with most of the other states. Under the law, possession would still be a presumed stay, presumed probation. The problem of the 459 convictions over the last five years for possession, for uh, dissemination, or possession, Minnesota vastly undercharges dissemination the most serious crime. Over the last five years, here's, I'll give you a comparison. Over the last five years, Oregon charged possession 92 times and dissemination distribution 260 times. While Minnesota charged possession 420 times, 427 times, and dissemination only 32 times. So four of us charging the lesser charge, which results in probation 26% of the time, while well, Minnesota is 93% of the time. Keep in mind, our guy isn't uh, necessarily tough on this stuff. It's the state that uh, Minnesota sets the guidelines commission cherry pick to compare it against. In plain math, that means if in the last five years, of data is indicative on a go-forward basis, the Minnesota Senate GOP bill would potentially affect roughly 4% of the convictions for training violent child sex abuse and imagery, resulting in, at most, maybe 20 more predators. 20 more predators being given short prison sentences during the next five years. More than 80% of predators would still receive probation, would still receive the presumed state. And, and it just it goes on. The information that I've gathered over these years and talking to uh, Child Protection League has helped me a lot. Uh, a young man named Will Crumbles has been a very big help for me as well. And then our research, our research, uh, nonpartisan and partisan research in the House. So out of 32 convicted of dissemination over the last five years, yeah, maybe that 20 would go to prison. The 427 charged with possession would still get probation. And that's just second sleep. So you know, I, I, need, I need everybody's help here. I need everybody's help here because I told the rest of the, I told the DFL in the House and I warned the Senate, GOP and DFL there. You guys have got to start helping to deal with this. 
or I'm going to throw you all under the bus. We're going to transition here to a panel.